Hi, everyone. I hope your health is in good shape and you're in a secure place. And let's get into it. Uh, some more discussion, as promised, on the 3000 Realms. A central component of Nietzsche and Daishonin's uh, doctrines and elucidations on the practice of of Lotus Sutra Buddhism. Uh, just as a, an interesting foreword, I think. This is from Shakyamuni's teachings of almost 3,000 years ago. So don't let it fall lightly on your ears how incredibly advanced this thinking was and is scientists are still grappling with the issues described in the 3000 realms in a single thought moment now I understand that specifically Shakyamuni didn't say this formula this this uh, language around this concept, but the language around this concept is directly from Shakyamuni's expedient means and his teachings. That is the source. What we're going to read is uh, some scholarship, again, uh, presented by Jacqueline Stone in her dissertation on the structure of the single thought moment comprising 3000 realms or as we have often heard it in Japanese, Ichinen and Sanzen. Um, as it's often presented in uh, Japanese Nichiren um, sectarian division, uh, schools of thought, it's often not discussed beyond the the simple casual reference to 3000 realms or Ichin and Sanzen as, as some sort of uh, karmic bank account, or, if you will. And so it leaves a lot of people mystified. And I, I, I really, I remember early in my practice how frustrating that was to me. So this is why I spend a little more time talking about it and I especially appreciate this breakdown and these quotes from Tendai himself. And we can see how Nietzschean took these elements and gave them uh, physical reality for our uh, modern minds that are so quickly distracted in many, many directions where it becomes difficult to encapsulate or embrace a certain kind of thinking, we almost require a visual or tactile representation of things to be able to get our minds to fully appreciate, grasp, understand concepts. It just goes along with the territory of our time. So without further ado, this isn't very long, but it's so well captured and written here that I think if you still have some confusion about the 3000 realms in a single thought moment, um, maybe this verbiage will make it gel for you. And especially with respect to why and how 
we practice Nietzschean's doctrine of it. So here we go. The single thought moment comprising 3,000 realms, or in Japanese, Ichin and Sanzen, represents the Tendai doctrine of the interpretation or the interpenetration of all things. And you can stop right there and think, what, what does that fancy word mean, interpenetration? Uh, a simple example could be how many beverages can you name that are based on water? And I don't just mean tea and coffee or chai, but also remember, read a can of soda, Coke, Pepsi, 7-Up, energy drinks, Gatorade, Monster, um, I can't name them all, Red Bull. The primary ingredient in all of those is water. So you could say that water interpenetrates all these beverages. You see, it's fundamentally a part of one another. Sugars interpenetrate all of these drinks in some form, not diet, obviously, but still a sugar substitute, some sweetener, certainly. So water and sweeteners interpenetrate right on and on and on so each and sanzen is a doctrine of the interpenetration of all things so now we're talking on the submolecular level we're talking about atoms we're talking about particles we're talking about energy again that all these different manifestations of things all are contained within and share the same component structure, including you and I. Remember, we're water too. That's really hard to grasp, right? We say it like it's a fact, but hard to visualize, right? The single thought moment designates the briefest possible moment in the thoughts of ordinary persons, like you and I, that arise from one moment to the next. While the 3,000 realms indicates the whole of reality. Everything. To perceive that one's own mind comprises the 3,000 realms, an example, the identity of one's self and all that is, universe, everything, forms the goal of Tendai's meditation. This is from the Moho Chi Kwan, where Tendai says, to seek enlightenment, his stage of meditation and concentration and calming is to visualize that there is no fundamental difference between every aspect of the human body, your human body, your skin, flesh, eyeballs, consciousness, digestion, heat, cool, bones, everything that you're granularly made of is absolutely shared and interwoven with all of those down to the atom elements of your body in the moon, sun, stars, planets, the universe, plants, animals, grass, house, friends, relatives. That were just different capsules of that stuff. Different formations of that stuff. The same stuff. 
that there is no real separation, that the idea of separation is our constantly classifying, distinguishing, identifying mind, trying to identify all the differences rather than seeing all the samenesses. Make sense? While the formulation of this exact expression appears to date from the sixth Tendai patriarch, Chan Zhan, in uh, the eighth century, who gives a detailed explanation in his Qi Quan Fa Xing Chuang Hong Chui, pardon my pronunciation, the concept itself was articulated by Tendai's founder, Qi Yi. A passage from Chi Yi's famous meditation manual, the Moho Chi Quan, Great Calming and Insight, provides the locus classicus. Now these are Chi Yi's words, well, translations of Chi Yi's words, right? Now one mind comprises ten Dharma realms, right? With the ten worlds we call them often. The ten realms, hell, hunger, animality, so on. But each Dharma realm, the realm of, say, uh, hungry ghosts, right? The, the, the hell of uh, the uh, world of hunger, insatiable desire. It also comprises the ten Dharma realms. So there's a Buddhahood aspect of hunger our tremendous driven desire for Buddhahood. There's a, a learning aspect of hunger where we accumulate information. There's a realization aspect of hunger, knowing how much is driving us. There's a hell aspect of hunger. Oh yeah, that deep craving for a Kit Kat bar or whatever it is, right? or relationship, or love, or whatever. It's not about the object being love or the Kit Kat bar. It's about our roiling mind regarding that object. Do you see? And if you interpenetrate all of those ten Dharma realms in one another, right, 10 times 10, you end up with 100 realms roiling and competing for attention moment to moment in your mind. And one, and um, 100 uh, Dharma realms, one realm comprises 30 kinds of realms. And this comes from extrapolating the 10 factors, the suchnesses how you particularly experience each of the hundred with all of their various components, appearance, essence, power, so on. Hence, a hundred Dharma realms comprise 3,000 kinds of realms. And I will remind you again, 3,000 realms, you sit here and you try to calculate and envision and it, it hurts the brain, Understand that we're doing this each and every thought moment. We're navigating through them. So pause on that for a moment and consider how it is that we really know our attitude or our intent when so much is going on in our heads. Is it any wonder that sometimes we feel like we really don't know what is motivating us. When we think to ourselves, what the hell am I doing? We seem to be pushed forward into decisions and actions that sometimes feel like they're not totally ours. And other times we feel total conviction. And yet this kind of evaluation and experience is happening on such a scale, it seems almost arrogant for us to assume we know what the hell we're doing. 
<laughs> I don't mean to frighten you, but understand the nature of mind. It's... And I point this out because when we chant and we use this mandala, we are reverberating our daimoku, our ninth consciousness, our buddhaness, through all of that to sift it out, to realign all of it. Imagine the power of being able to align every single th of the 3,000 realms in each single thought moment toward one goal. How amazingly powerful would that be? And yet this is what our practice is. When we chant, Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, it's like those hundreds of thousands of realms that are occurring each minute are being called to attention and all pointing in one direction, Buddhahood. There's a visual, right? These 3,000 are contained in a fleeting moment of thought. Where there is no mind, that is the end of the matter. If mind comes into being to the slightest degree whatsoever, it immediately contains the 3,000. This English translation is quoted from William Theodore de Berry and others from a source of a book called Sources of Chinese Tradition, Volume 2, Columbia University Press, 1960. So there's the accreditation of that quote. But I want to read one part of a sentence. Well, the whole sentence. This is central, this sentence I'm about to read, to all of my discussions with you on our physical death. And the idea that there might be some bag of Bob or Betty that continues through the universe or whatever. The idea of soul that Shakyamuni got rid of very early on in his teaching, the Anatman, there just isn't no extant permanent thing. It's so hard for us to get that through our heads. This is the the whole science of impermanence, the whole discussion of emptiness, the whole discussion of anatman, all of these, and they're, they're rampant, and there's lots of discussion uh, through hundreds of years of scholarship of Nargarjuna, Vasubandhu, and so on and so forth, Shakyamuni, of course, talking about this particular delusion that our 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 craving of identity and our identification with things is so profound that we can't let go of the idea that there's a me that continues on and comes back time and time again. That's just fantasy and it's, it's fantasy at an infantile level. It's, it's not even juvenile. And so let me read this sentence once again. Because your total experience of you, me, self, identification is in the mind. I don't think we can argue that. It's not in the palm of my hand. It's not in my cough or my skin which gets, all of which gets renewed moment to moment by marrow, mitochondria, blah, blah, blah. We know this scientifically. But in our minds, man, we're stuck with that samsaric eye craving of identity. So I'm going to read it again. Where there is no mind, 
The mind, as we've discussed, is an emergent property of this entire apparatus. Where there is no mind, that is the end of the matter. No 3,000 realms, no inter, um, interpenetration, no existence. Where there is no mind, that is the end of the matter. If mind comes into being, if mind arises from all of this karma, from all of this interpenetrating creation, uh, manifestation, instantiation, leads to forms of life that can emerge a mind, then immediately in the womb contains the 3,000. Only in this human life where a mind is emergent do we experience life. Although the mind, I'm continuing, although the mind at each thought moment is said to contain the 3,000 realms, Chi Yi is careful to make it clear that in his system, the mind is not prior to the dharmas. Right? You might say, well, there was a mind all along. It's just suddenly it's aware. <laughs> Again, that's another way of hanging on to this permanence. Oh, the mind is permanent. Consciousness is permanent. No, it is not. It is an emergent property of this very complicated formation. One may say, and this is another quote from Chi E. One may say neither that the one mind is prior to, or prior and all dharmas posterior, nor that all dharmas are prior and that the one mind posterior. In other words, he goes both ways. No, there's not existent mind in the, in the air, and then it fabricates or envisions these 3,000 realms. Nor can you say these 3,000 realms, and pay attention, Ichin and Sanzen kids, it does not mean that the 3,000 realms pre-existed the mind, your mind, my mind. It's not saying that. That is not Ichin and Sanzen. That is not the 3,000 realms in a single moment, thought moment. Why is this important? Because the 3,000 realms in a single thought moment though it is a vast conceptualization of life experience, it nevertheless is specific, specific to the mind that perceives it. Your 3,000 realms in every single thought moment are specific to you, as are the 3,000 realms my mind experiences in each thought moment. And if you think about it, totally makes sense. For the same reason that although I share every energy in my body, all the formations of liver cells, eyeball cells, so on and so forth, share the same origin, the same makeup, as this book or those trees or the rain that's falling right now, the entire universe, in fact, they are nevertheless a formation, a formation with some specificity. And that specificity creates this vessel of me. And no matter how much you and I share those exact same molecules, energies, the formations of them mean that I and you 
are qualitatively, quantifiably different. You follow? Understand that the mind is emergent from this. Your mind is emergent from you, from your apparatus. And that mind, emergent from your formations, will have 3,000 realms of experience all quantified and qualified by your emergent physical instantiation, your formation. Ah, that's amazing to think that we've gone from this huge thought bubble to specific instantiations of that thought bubble that are unique from one another. Yes, we may share much closeness. This is why we can attempt to understand one another. But even at that most infinitesimal understanding, there's still going to be slight differences. This is where the discussion of karma can have some value, some meat, right? So Chi Yi continues, If one derives all dharmas from one mind, this is a vertical relationship. If the mind all, all at once contains all dharmas, this is a horizontal relationship. Neither vertical nor horizontal will do. All one can say is that the mind is all dharmas, and all dharmas are the mind, which is what I just explained. The mind being an emergent quality of all human formations, certainly we can grasp that, but that that same mind is individuated by the formations from which it emerges. Well, that makes sense. Water, it rain that emerges from water that is tainted with chemical smoke and exhaust into the atmosphere, we call it acid rain because it contains component of the formations that made that moisture. Everything works this way. Why not you and I? Let's continue. Therefore, the relationship is neither vertical nor horizontal, neither the same nor different. It is obscure, subtle, and profound in the extreme. Oh, yeah. Knowledge cannot know it, nor words speak it. Knowledge cannot know it, nor words speak it. Herein lies the reason for its being called the realm of the inconceivable. That again is from William Theodore de Berry and all sources of Chinese tradition, volume two, page 328. Continuing with the dissertation, unlike those Mahayana models in which all dharmas are said to arise from the one pure mind, a distinctive characteristic of the Tendai system is that pure and impure are said to constantly interpenetrate. The most right Buddhahood is in all of the realms. So all of the realms extant. There isn't just one all-seeing Buddha mind. The Buddha mind is yours, mine, qualitatively arriving to a nexus, albeit through subtly different karmic minds. The most depraved Ichantika possesses the Buddha nature. While the Buddha, still latent, 
possesses the evil or negativity of enlightened beings, unenlightened beings. Sorry. To explain the structure of the single thought moment being simultaneously 3,000 realms, we note, first of all, that Chi Yi says that the mind comprises the ten Dharma realms. These ten realms refer to the ten categories of living beings, hell dwellers, hungry ghosts, ashura demons, humans, gods, voice hearers, uh, conditioned perceivers, bodhisattvas, and Buddhas. Now, a lot of people stop here. A lot of people will tell you, oh, I'm, I'm in the world of hungry ghosts right now. Or, um, or he's really smart. He's one of the voice hearers. He understands Buddhism really well. Um, I want to disabuse you of that kind of thinking. Because I will remind you once again that all of this happens in one single thought moment. So add the complexity that all of these 10 are interpenetrating. You start to accelerate that kind of changing of mind thing from hunger to realization to hell of depression and having a moment of clarity, Bodhisattva, Buddha, learning, realization, they all happen within one another and not just in pairs. This accumulates to indicate how quickly, how vastly fast the mind navigates through all of these Decision making. The, the, Shakyamuni tried to discuss this one time, and it, it was saying that there are over 180,000 decisions made in each moment of time. This is what he was referring to. It's impossible to trace what world you're in right now. That is the nonsense statement. We don't live in certain worlds or realms we live constantly in 3000 the way we navigate through those and express ourselves in life is again a function of the formations right these 10 realms refer to the 10 categories of living beings while these 10 are ranged hierarchically, like vertically, from the viewpoint of provisional existence, from the standpoint of emptiness, they lack independent self-nature and therefore interpenetrate. So we never rest at any one of them. They're, they're doorways, they're passages. Thus making a hundred Dharma realms. We're constantly zigzagging our way through all of these worlds. The mutual possession or co-penetration of the ten realms collapses any ontological distinction between the Buddha and the beings. Ah, that's a neat key right there. Not only are we flying through these different realms, but Buddhahood is always in the mix. So it's always been there all along original enlightenment doctrine. You see how everything aligns here? Implying that the nine realms of unenlightened beings possess the Buddha nature inherently, while the Buddha possesses the nine realms of unenlightened beings. They're coexistent all the time. In where? The mind. Each of the ten realms further possesses the ten suchnesses. Jun Yose. Right? Yose in, Yose in, Yose in, Yose in, right? Which constitute the true, quote unquote, true aspect of the dharmas. The true aspects of the dharmas. The dharmas are an emergent property part and parcel 
of mind. They're not places. They're mind activity. As set forth in the following passage of the Lotus Sutra, quote, Only a Buddha and a Buddha together can fathom the true aspect of the Dharmas. That is to say, the suchness of their characteristics, the suchness of their nature, the suchness of their essence, the suchness of their power, Yosein, 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 huh? the suchness of their activity, the suchness of their causes, the suchness of their conditions, the suchness of their effect. What are we saying here? The particular expression of the formations that make you and your mind and your perception of these worlds is your particular suchness of all of that activity in your mind the suchness of their recompenses and the suchness of their ultimate equality from beginning to end. From your physical birth to your extinction. Because that's the only place your mind, those realms, the filtering and interpenetration of those realms expresses itself completely independently of my mind from its karmic energies, the, the energy that started it all as it forms into your constantly moment to moment, birth, death, birth, death, formation, 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 endurance, decay, and dissolution, formation, endurance, decay. And there's, there's, a, there's a train of mind going there and what filters through your 3,000 realms are your 3,000 realms filtration of experience. Your experience is individual to you. All of it has Buddha. All of it has hell, hunger, animality. Right? Every, if you could take every single one of those 3,000, which is a, it's kind of a fake number, just indicating how huge... The population is and make a little standing soldier out of every single one of those and how they're colored by what their their formations are right and you stood them all up <laughs> what a visual right and they're all running into each other going different ways and there are enough going certain ways that they create a train of thought and again, when we chant, it's like saying, attention! And all of those soldiers go, Hoo. now you can align the Buddhahood in each one of them to realize clearly what's going on. Namo myoho There's a visualization. Chi Yi explains these ten suchnesses as follows. In his Miao Fa Lin Hu Ching Xuan Yi, <laughs> sorry, characteristics has its point of reference externally. What do you look like? What can be distinguished by being seen is called characteristics. Nature has its point of reference internally that which intrinsically belongs to oneself and does not change is called nature, your habit energy. That which is central quality of something is called essence, something you never seem to deviate from. The ability to influence is called power. Well, I'm always talking about influence, right? How you project, how your very components of characteristics and nature and essence project into the world around us. That which constructs is called activity, right? Action is what produces everything. Actions are, well, repetitive causes are called causes, i.e. karma. Auxiliary causes are called conditions, 
Repetitive results are called effects. Retributive effects are called recompense. The first characteristics is called the beginning. The ninth recompense is called the end. And the place to which they belong is ultimately equal. This is an English translation from Paul L. Swanson from his book, Foundations of Tendai Philosophy, page 184, slightly modified. I hope this is starting to gel. And if, if nothing else, what I hope you get out of this is a deepening of your understanding, your appreciation of how profound, even though it's so simple, how profound it is, the act we make when we chant the Daimoku, especially with our focus on this mandala to penetrate, call to attention those unfathomable number of little soldiers of thoughts to one reality, one perception, one understanding, the clarity, the focus. It's truly flooring. It should amaze you that you can do that so easily. The ten Dharma realms interpenetrating to form a hundred realms that each simultaneously possesses the ten suchnesses is called the thousand suchnesses. Moreover, each of the ten Dharma realms may be understood in terms of the three realms, Sanseken. <laughs> this, now these multipliers are, are just, if you can understand them, just conceptually, you're doing well. The three, how do we get to 3,000, right? Again, that's a figurative number, but understand it's created very logistically, right? We have 10 realms, interpenetrating, creating 100 realms, all each of them with 10 suchnesses. That's 1,000 suchnesses, 1,000 ways of perception. And they are accumulated from a factor of three. Three what? The realm of five skandhas, or aggregates. The senses, vision, aural, feeling, touch. The, the five skandhas, the mind, our perception. All affecting those suchnesses. That's one. Two, the realm of living beings. Because, of course, this is where the mind exists. So it is not only influence outward, but it is influenced. How many influences do you have? Is your television on? Do you watch Instagram? How many influences? YouTube YouTubers, when they have a lot of people following them, they're called influencers. It's everywhere. And thirdly, the realm of the land. Where are you? What are the conditions? What's the weather? What conditions are you in relative to that? All those conditions. That also influences the pattern, the shifts, the decisions, such as they are, of your mind's instantiation of these suchnesses, that renders, well, far more than 3,000, really. That's just a governing number. 
to start you on the path of understanding. Because if you break it down to the skandhas, five, and the realm of living beings, and then the realm of the land, with all its various conditions and tendencies, well, the number it just keeps growing. These are enumerated in the Tachi Tunlun and elsewhere. The realm of the five skandhas represents an analysis of the sentient being into its psychosomatic constituents, forms, perceptions, conceptions, volitions, and consciousness. Consciousness is, right? The realm of living beings views the living being as an independent existent that can be said to be belong to one or another of the ten Dharma realms. <gasps> They're back. So that's circular. Suddenly the ten the suchnesses are all viewed through the suchnesses. The realm of the land is the objective realm in which the beings dwell. Objective seen subjectively because each of the ten dharma realms which embodies the ten suchnesses can also be understood in terms of these three categories as chi e says one realm comprises 30 kinds of realm thus the ten dharma realms co-penetrating yield a hundred realms multiplied ten times uh the ten suchnesses, they yield a thousand suchnesses, and multiplied times the three realms, they equal three thousand realms. Yeah, we got it. The number three thousand is itself arbitrary, as I've just shown. The point is that, quote, all of reality is an integrated, interdependent unity, end quote. If you look at humanity, like looking at the universe, we can see and we can understand that this is the process of all phenomena. We are not unique. We are no different than Jupiter in process, in the way we manifest reality. We are, as I've used the word before, constructed Consciousnesses, ideas, identity is a constructed thing from the same formations or formation energy. As Paul Swanson succinctly puts it, the concept of the three thousand, well, that's what he just said. The, the all reality is an integrated, interdependent unity. That's what Paul Swanson say, said. The concept of the three thousand realms in a single thought moment is not, however, merely an ontological analysis of the structure of reality. This realm of the inconceivable is to be perceived in meditation by the practitioner. This is the Mohishikwan who in doing so realizes the identity of him or herself with the totality of all that is. You understand our interconnection, our interpenetration with the entirety of the universe. We cease to be individuated outside of, obviously, our mental construct of quote-unquote self. And this is what I spoke about several videos ago. The energy manifestations, the flow of energy in everything around us. It is something we can perceive with abundant daimoku, with practice, with good recitations. We align all our soldiers. And when we look away from our butsudan, and take a breath, everything in our environment seems to be not quite at rest. Everything seems to have, and you'll see it, we'll all see it our own way. It's either sparkly or kind of just energetic in some way. The 
differences seem to be palpable, but we seem to see past or experience past or understand past the differences to a quality of emergent, almost like you could float through it. If you saw a movie with uh, Robin Williams called uh, Things, Things May Come, I don't remember the title, but he was running through a field that turned into paint, like he was running through a painting. There's some wonderful visuals in that movie that remind me of this kind of thinking. Now, what's important about understanding this, other than your own resolve, your own understanding of profundity of your practice and valuing that practice, that ability to enlighten? Nichiren had his own interpretation of the Ichinen Sanzen concept for us. As described in his Kanjin Honzon Sho and other writings, and we're going to be reading a different uh, translation of that soon. In his view, the 3,000 realms in a single thought moment of the mind of ordinary persons to be perceived in meditation as Chi Yi had taught was Ichinen Sanzen in principle. Okay, this is the analytical discussion of how the mind operates. Got it. For him, though, Nichiren, the single thought moment containing 3,000 realms was the thought moment of the eternal Buddha revealed in the origin teaching of the Lotus Sutra. We've already discussed that. Embodied in the Daimoku of the Lotus Sutra and manifested in the mandala that he, Nichiren, had inscribed. He gave us a concrete focal point to get all our soldiers in a row by invoking the very teaching that Shakyamuni gave us to instantiate his own enlightenment. Quite simply, Myoho Renge Kyo, dedicate your mind and body, Namu, to this overwhelming, really, profundity of the nature of all phenomena, Myoho Renge Kyo, and you will experience awakening. You will begin to see your own Buddha nature and therefore the Buddha nature of all phenomena. This he termed Ichinen Sanjan in actuality. So basically Nichiren is saying, we know what Buddha taught, we know through intense scholarship from folks like Chi Yi, how it works, and now, in this modern time, we have a tool to simply do it, to actualize it, not just understand it intellectually. I mean, that's great and all, but so what? You can understand every moving part in a vehicle, but ultimately, can you go buy groceries? Let's get this thing moving. Let's make it happen. Right? This is what Nichiren provides you and I. To chant the Daimoku before the mandala was thus to realize the identity of oneself and the Dharma realm and, Nichiren claims, constitute correct practice for the final Dharma age. There it is. That small document we just went over, is probably the most succinct, although profound, not difficult to understand, explanation of the advent of Nichiren, the value of this mandala, the profundity of our chanting the Daimoku, and everything that it implies, and finally, puts a nice, strong period at the end of 
the statement about Ichin and Sanzen. This formation energy in all of its various instantiations reunited as a singular experience by doing what? Chanting Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. Using this mandala. Using this mandala becomes critical because it is the embodiment of that very process. But it's static. It's just a thing on the wall until we apply our mind to it to enliven the crystal of our Buddha mind. That's why he constantly calls it the perfect reflector. We don't worship that scroll. Worship is for children to play games. What we do is we start the car and then we drive it. Namo myoho renge kyo. Ah, I didn't check the clock once. Well, that was an important discussion. I'm glad we had it. Please, please, if I mumbled through any of it or if some of it still befuddles you, this is an important one. So please say so in the comments. Let me know what I need to clear up. Let me know your own experience of it. I want to hear the successes you're having, the moments of clarity you're having. Thank you. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you for being courageous, stalwart in your practice. Ugh, I get these moments of pride, not because I'm creating anything, but because I'm so amazed by your courage, your dedication, your practice. Do not let up. The payoff is constant and grows with each iteration. Please have confidence in that. Those of you who are supporting this channel, need I say again, your rewards from this practice, I don't even understand. But I am grateful, deeply grateful for your support. And I guess with that, that's, I have nothing else to say. Really? <laughs> Until the next one, and I'll see you then. Take care of your health. Be kind. Namo myoho renge kyo.